really? Close your eyes. Now forget what you see. What do you feel? Tarzan. He's embarrassing. But uh, my friend might have been banished. The Phantom Menace. What do these three films have in common? Well, they all use animation, an art form that's been around since the beginning of the movies and is poised to be even more important in the 21st century. And the many worlds of animation are the subject of this special edition, which we're calling That's Not All, Folks. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Animation as an art form is even older than the movies. It goes back to those little flip books that we used to have in grade school that created the illusion of motion. And now, at the end of the film's first century, it seems poised to finally come into its own as an art form for adults as well as for children. And that's what this special show is about. When I was a kid, I liked animated movies better than live action ones for a reason that made perfect sense to me at the time, which was they seemed more real. Yes, more real than live action, where there were confusing things going on and lots of ambiguity that a kid couldn't understand. While in a cartoon, everything had sharp edges and bright colors and the motivations were clear and the story jumped off the screen and into my imagination. Walt Disney's Snow White was the first animated film I saw, and Pinocchio was the second, and that one is still my favorite. Oh, oh look! My nose! What's happened? Perhaps you haven't been telling the truth, Pinocchio. And, of course, Disney has been the leading source of animation ever since, with blockbusters like Beauty and the Beast, with its freewheeling choreography, The Lion King, which caught the majesty of nature, and Aladdin, where the animators matched Robin Williams' improvisation. Aladdin. Aladdin! Hello, Aladdin. Nice to have you on the show. Can we call you Al? Or maybe just Din? How about Laddie? For decades, Disney had a lock on the animation box office and also on the look of animated films, which grew technically more advanced, but still kept the hard-edged clarity of Walt's first cartoons. In the last few years, however, with the advance of computer tools that make animation faster, and a lot more flexible, both Disney and its competitors have created a new wave of animation. Toy Story, created by Pixar for Disney entirely on computers, had an uncanny three-dimensional look. You weren't the real Buzz Lightyear, you were, oh, you're an action figure! Ants from DreamWorks created amazing vistas like this metropolis inside an anthill. And Disney's A Bug's Life was free to swoop through space in 3D instead of being trapped within flat drawing surfaces. There's a new freedom of content, too. Budget restrictions make live-action epics harder and harder to produce, but a film like The Prince of Egypt can pick up where traditional biblical epics left off. But animation specifically for grown-ups has had a harder time. Back in the 1970s, American animator Ralph Bakshi had some success with films like Fritz the Cat, but was never quite able to break down the notion the cartoons were for kids. You, you can help me. You must save me. But... These days, animation is big box office when you can see it, and also when you can't. It's sneaking into movies that you don't even realize are using animation. Computerized imaging techniques were used, for example, in Forrest Gump to create the famous floating feather. And in What Dreams May Come, which won an Oscar for its spectacular view of heaven as an oil painting. And in Babe, Pig in the City, which mixes real animals with animation and animatronics. It's a uh, kind of a baldy, pinky, whitey thingy. Show me in. And in Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, George Lucas told me that 95% of the shots in the film contain digital effects, and one of the main characters, an alien named Jar Jar Binks, is fully computer animated. Your support is well seen. This way, hurry! And, of course, cartoon characters that can coexist with real ones, which is how Bob Hoskins met Jessica Rabbit. Give me some money, too. Michael Jordan met Bugs Bunny. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, we need your help! Those last two movies combine live action and animation, and that brings up a crucial distinction. Because in my mind, it isn't animation unless it looks like animation. Otherwise, it ought to be referred to as just special effects. The whole point about animation is that it looks artificial and stylized, and like a drawing instead of like photography. 
The greatest freedom for that kind of stylized drawing is not in the movies these days, surprisingly, but on television, which is an explosive growth area for new looks and animation. The success of The Simpsons has led in the last 10 years to a surprisingly popular series of animated TV programs. I owe Dad so much. Those bedtime stories began my lifelong love affair with the printed word. Just for example, the Fox Network devotes two hours of prime time on Tuesdays to animation, starting with King of the Hill. Dear Buckley's Angel, bring me a woman, any woman. And on cable, HBO has the much darker series Spawn, based on Todd McFarlane's popular comic book character. <laughs> Meanwhile, cartoons for kids used to be limited to old reruns and dumb action adventures, but now there's a lot more creativity. The lineup of network shows called One Saturday Morning has fresh characters like Doug and Pepper Ann. And very small kids are targeted by Nickelodeon's Rugrats, while older audiences like the satirical edge of Comedy Central's South Park. You guys can stop fighting. It was me she was checking out until you puked on her. And there's a boom in made-for-video animation that goes straight to the video stores. For example, The Return of Jafar, a sequel to Aladdin. And The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride. Why has there been such a sudden explosion of animation? Well, one obvious reason is that all of a sudden, it's easier. Instead of laboriously drawing thousands of cells by hand, animators can now let a computer do the in-between work. And simple stylized animation in the style, say, of South Park can be created on virtually anybody's home computer. In fact, it was created on a home computer. Another reason is that animation is now the home of the movie musical. Musicals used to be one of the most popular genres in Hollywood, but in recent decades, they've all but disappeared, except, of course, that a lot of animated features are musicals, with choreography freed from the laws of gravity. When we come back, a look at the big business of animation as Hollywood Studios wage cartoon wars. Mom, could you remind me, why am I marrying this guy? This is a scene from Ants, which was released by DreamWorks in October of 1998. And this is a scene from A Bug's Life, which was released by Disney in November of 1998. It's the same year after year. They come, they eat, they leave. That's our lot in life. It's not a lot, but it's our life. <laughs> both films were animated, and they were both about bugs, but they weren't really similar except in superficial ways. I liked them both, and I recommended them both, but those two titles are evidence of a Hollywood animation war. The renaissance of animation at Disney was overseen by animation head Roy Disney and executive Jeffrey Katzenberg, whose production of The Little Mermaid in 1989 signaled a rebirth in the studio's animation efforts. Wandering free, wish I could be part of that world. After he left to become a founder of rival studio DreamWorks SKG, Katzenberg challenged Disney's domination of the animation box office at his new studio, and his first two efforts, Ants and The Prince of Egypt, were big hits, although neither one did the kind of business that Disney hits like Aladdin and The Lion King do, maybe because their stories were too advanced for the broadest family markets. Other studios were also no longer leaving it to Disney. They were lining up for their own piece of the animation pie. Animator Don Bluth, who started with Disney, has had hits like An American Tale, well, that is more America. And The Land Before Time. Both of those were released by Universal. Two years ago, 20th Century Fox released Anastasia, a wonderful film that deserved to sell a lot more tickets than it did. Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers made money with Space Jam, but they didn't have much success with The Quest for Camelot. And in 1999, its version of The King and I was a bomb, partly because the animation looked just plain anemic. Have children prepare for presentation, etc. But Hollywood was startled by two TV spin-offs from Paramount that were surprisingly successful. Beavis and Butthead Do America was a moneymaker, but who could have anticipated the enormous desire of all the little kids who insisted on being taken to the Rugrats movie, also released by Paramount? They knew the show from Nickelodeon, and they wanted to go to the movie. <laughs> Those last two movies didn't look like, sound like, or play like traditional animation, but they did a lot of business. 
And as the Rugrats audience grows older, it may signal a wider range of artistic freedom in animated films. Movies that experiment with unexpected visual styles and use the built-in exaggeration of all animation as a tool for sharp comedy and wild satire. When we come back, a longer look at why animation and special effects are not the same thing. We used to laugh at the incredibly bad special effects in monster movies like when dinosaurs ruled the earth. But nobody laughed when these dinosaurs appeared in Jurassic Park. I said earlier that it's not animation unless it looks like animation. That's my theory anyway, and I want to get back to it. In recent years, Hollywood has found ways to achieve an invisible, seamless marriage between computer-generated figures and live action. The dinosaurs in Jurassic Park don't just walk through the backgrounds of shots as they did in old movies. They seem to move without effort through the same space as the actors. It's, it's a dinosaur. I really enjoyed Jurassic Park. But in a certain strange way, maybe some of these movies are getting to be too good. Some of the new techniques are so convincing that I have almost a problem with them. I like some of the old-fashioned stop-action animation sequences for the precise reason that they do look odd and artificial. Look at the way the fur seems to crawl on this shot from the classic version of King Kong. This is one frame at a time, stop-motion animation, and what you're really seeing are the fingerprints of the animator. <coughs> Big Ape there looks phony, but he feels real. And now take another look at the digital lizard created by computers for the latest Godzilla. This time, the monster looks real, but it feels phony. Another example, look at Ray Harryhausen's work here with these frankly artificial dueling skeletons in Jason and the Argonauts, which uses stop-action animation. Get back. And now look at these cleverly animated bug-eyed monsters in Starship Troopers, which uses computer-generated images. For my money, in both of those comparisons, the older film is creepier and somehow more magical. It proves that any technical advance is only a tool. What really matters is how well filmmakers make use of it. We shouldn't even call it animation if it blends seamlessly with reality. But as important as the look is to animated movies, so is the content. Certain kinds of stories are better suited to animation than to live action. Movies based on comic books, for example. I mentioned Spawn from HBO earlier. Well, I love the Batman comics where their extreme visual angles and their dark shadows and noir plots, and I actually think Batman works better in animation than live action. And since Warner Brothers makes Batman movies in both formats, let's make a side-by-side -side comparison. Here's the city at night in Batman and Robin. And here's a similar scene from the direct-to-video release Batman Beyond. And how about Tarzan? What looks like more fun? Johnny Weissmuller swinging on a vine? Or an animated Tarzan who defies gravity? I gotta say, in each one of those cases, I prefer the animated version. Animation allows artistic imagination to run riot without the budget running riot at the same time. You want to animate one person or a thousand people, it costs about the same in animation. In live action, it doesn't. Animation gives filmmakers the freedom to do big stories without the compromises that big budgets bring along with them. And here's a bulletin. The Sony Playstations that will be marketed next year will have about the same computing power as the computers that made Toy Story, about five million instructions per second kids will be able to create real-time animation on their own computers. Will that be the beginning of an artistic renaissance, or maybe will it just make for more point-and-shoot video games? Well, it's a good question. We'll look at the boom in Japanese animation when we come back. She's all right! Your princess is safe with me!
That's a scene from Princess Mononoke, an animated film that's going to be released in this country by Miramax. It was directed by a man named Hayao Miyazaki, the king of Japanese animation. In Japan, the name for animation is anime, which is spelled like this. American showbiz journalists have almost entirely overlooked the amazing boom right now in anime in American video stores. You never read about anime in the paper or hear it discussed on television, but walk into any video store, even in a small town, and you'll see hundreds of anime tapes which are being rented by somebody like crazy. The first anime title to get a wide theatrical release in America was Akira in 1988, a movie by Katsuhiro Otomo. It looked just like a modern sci-fi action picture like Blade Runner or The Matrix, except, of course, it was animated. Among the titles I've admired the most have been Miyazaki's My Neighbor Totoro, about two young children and their friendship with a giant woodland creature. And Miyazaki's Kiki's Delivery Service, about a 12-year-old witch who flies into town and gets a job delivering bread for a bakery. Oh! Oh my goodness! But anime also deals with serious adult themes. For example, Rouge and Z is an Orwellian satire about a future society where the elderly are locked into computer-controlled containers to take care of all their needs. Steam drying is standard on all models. And Ghost in the Shell is a science fiction film about an interface between humans and computers. HQ, patch me target info from the district controlling that truck. One of the visual hallmarks of Japanese animation is extreme facial stylization. Anime artists like big, round eyes and great big mouths because they make it easier to suggest emotions. And they're having an influence on American animators. Look at the characters in My Neighbor Totoro here, and now look at the orphan boy adopted by apes in Disney's new animated feature, Tarzan. I think he gains in expressiveness because of the Japanese influence. In a typical year in Japan, animated films can account for 25 to 33 percent of the box office. They're really tuned in to the artistic look of drawn action. When we come back, a look at some of this summer's animated features. It may be that 1999 will be a watershed year for animated films as they continue to break away from the family film ghetto and explore new terrain. This has been a big summer for animation with releases from three major studios. First out of the gate was Tarzan, Disney's big summer hit, which liberated the ape man to fly through the trees almost as if he was surfing on vines. Another big summer success was the hard-biting South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. I gave South Park a marginal thumbs down because of what I thought was the movie's mean spirit, but I did admire its intelligence and energy, and as the smoke clears after the summer of 1999, it's clear to me that this was a movie that took chances and made scathing criticisms of the broken down MPAA rating system. Maybe I got carried away by my immediate reaction. This is really a very good film. Nothing but foul language and toilet humor. Well, I guess I'll have to send a warning letter out to parents before more children see Terrence and Village. Everybody's seen it. Eric! I'm sorry, I can't help myself. That movie has warped my fragile little mind. The Iron Giant told the story with great energy and style, and by using animation, it was able to show us things that would have cost millions to duplicate in special effects. And this fall, Princess Mononoke will get a theatrical release from Miramax, which thinks it knows how to handle crossover animated titles. They're going to pitch it to adults as well as kids. <laughs> Animation is a liberating film style, allowing directors to go anywhere and do literally almost anything that they can possibly imagine. Computers are making its budgets grow smaller every year, and I think this is an exciting time for one of the oldest techniques in the movies. That's it for this special show. Remember to visit our website, siskel-ebert.com, part of the Go Network. 
Next week, new movies, including Dudley Do-Right, starring Brendan Fraser in the live-action remake of the popular TV cartoon. And Chill Factor, starring Cuba Gooding Jr. and Skeet Ulrich as two small-town guys out to save the world from terrorism. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. David's Bridal, America's premier bridal fashion authority, has thousands of affordable designer gowns and dresses for brides, bridesmaids, mothers, and flower girls. Call 1-800-399-BRIDE. America Online 4.0, the easiest just got easier. AOL has got it all. Email, internet, and a whole lot more. Where else are you going to find all this? America Online, so easy to use, no wonder it's number one. Urinary pain isn't going to stop you today. Uristat, from the makers of Monistat, relieves urinary pain until you can see your doctor. Now on pay-per-view, Will Smith. Why are they after me? And Gene Hackman. You have something they want! In the year's biggest thriller, Enemy of the State, rated R. Closed captioning for Siskel and Ebert is sponsored by... Hi. Hey. You quit smoking. He didn't quit. He uses Targon mouthwash. Look how Targon removes tobacco tar. If you smoke, use Targon.